So last Thursday, Joe Biden launched what's supposed to be the centerpiece of his foreign policy, a summit for democracies. He gathered uh, almost 100 foreign leaders for what was basically a glorified Zoom call. There are many reasons why this anti-authoritarian grouping is a joke, but first and foremost would be U.S. support for Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates. Saudi Arabia, the UAE, Qatar, and Kuwait weren't invited to the summit, of course, but it's really important to emphasize that these countries only exist because of U.S. support. Qatar, Kuwait, and the Emirates are all tiny. They would have been swallowed up long ago if it weren't for U.S. protection. Saudi Arabia is a more viable territorial unit, but its absurd political system would not exist if it weren't set up by the British and maintained by the United States over the past 100 years. These countries are all monarchies. Some of them have differing levels of BS legislatures involved, but in practice, they are all countries owned and operated by a single family. These are not constitutional monarchies like the United Kingdom or Japan. These are absolute monarchies, a medieval system of government that probably wouldn't exist anymore if the United States wasn't maintaining it. We do not talk about this enough. Heck, I don't talk about this enough. I've covered Saudi and Emirati crimes in Yemen for years now. Back in 2018, the Saudi murder of a journalist and dissident, Jamal Khashoggi, became a worldwide cause celeb. But we pay very little attention to how fundamentally discrediting it is that the world's leading democracy is the world's biggest supporter of absolute monarchy. Even the U.S.'s slaveholding founding fathers would have seen this as worthy of contempt. Have you ever read the U.S. Declaration of Independence? It's a ringing condemnation of British monarchy. It's mostly just an itemized list of why it is evil and wrong to have a king. This is our country's DNA. Long before the U.S. was opposed to communism or totalitarianism, we were opposed to the idea that any person had any rights against any other person just because they were born into it. Opposition to aristocracy and monarchy is one of our country's highest ideals, if not the highest ideal. And honestly, George III, the guy, the guys who wrote the Declaration of Independence were rebelling against? Compared to the Saudis, he looks like Gandhi. It's 240 years later, and we are supporting systems that are significantly worse than the system we rebelled against. These guys owned slaves, and they would look down on our lack of commitment to freedom. And in this one respect, they'd be right to. It would be one thing if the Gulf monarchies were just vestigial historical weirdness like the Vatican or Eswatini, but they have used U.S. protection to set themselves up as power players across the Middle East and Africa, and they use that power to crush democratic aspirations everywhere they can. In 2011, the world witnessed the outbreak of the Arab Spring. Starting in Tunisia, protests quickly spread across the Arab world, filling the world with hope and filling Arab monarchs and dictators with terror. Elections and democratic governments spread across the region, contradicting decades of propaganda put out by Arab kings that had claimed that their people just weren't interested in things like democracy. Ten years later, it's common to look at the Arab Spring as a failure, as a waste of time that was doomed from the very beginning. This is the way that Saudi Arabia and the UAE want you to see things. Because if you dive into the details, it becomes clear that their fingerprints are all over the corpse of the Arab Spring. Arab democracy didn't die a natural death. It was murdered by Saudi Arabia and the UAE, two Gulf monarchies armed and supported by the United States. I talk about Yemen on this channel a lot. Saudi Arabia has been intimately involved in that country for decades. After their puppet dictator Saleh fell, the Saudis manipulated a new one into power. Hadi, the new guy, was so incompetent that he was chased out of the country not once but twice by two completely different groups of militias in two different geographical regions of the country. Saudi Arabia has kept a vicious war going to this day. 
Things in tiny Bahrain were much more simple. An uprising looked like it might topple its leader, so in March 2011, the Saudis and Emiratis simply invaded to crush that uprising. That crackdown, combined with generous increases in social spending, were sufficient to keep the rest of the Gulf monarchies quiet. Syria was much more complicated. For a moment there, there was a peaceful, liberal opposition that wanted to depose Assad. The Gulf monarchies didn't like Assad, but they didn't want a peaceful, liberal Syria either. So they poured in billions to back the worst jihadis they could find, mutating the Syrian uprising into the horrors of al-Nusra and the Islamic State. Syria and Iraq are still dealing with the aftereffects of that horrific decision today. In 2012, Egypt elected its first democratically elected president in its 5,000-year history. The UAE and Saudi Arabia did everything they could to bring him down. Mohamed Morsi was not a good president, but that doesn't mean he deserved to die in prison after watching hundreds of his supporters get slaughtered in the streets by the Egyptian military. Sisi, Egypt's current dictator, was heavily supported by Saudi Arabia and the UAE during and after the 2013 coup. In 2019, in what some have called the Arab Spring's second wave, the longtime dictator of Sudan fell, leading to the establishment of a very uneasy transitional government where the military shared power with civilians. In October 2021, the military kicked out the civilian elements of the government in yet another coup. And who are the biggest supporters of the anti-democracy military in Sudan? You guessed it, it's Saudi Arabia and the UAE. The Biden administration has forced the Gulf monarchies to put out some discouraging words about the current coup, but it's not like the funding relationships are changing in the slightest. Libya is probably the country most abused by the Gulf. The story since NATO overthrew Gaddafi in 2011 is very sad and very long, and I have a bunch of other videos covering it. The Saudis and Emiratis are most famous for supporting Khalifa Haftar, a wannabe strongman who spent a couple years attempting to conquer the UN-approved consensus government in Tripoli. Haftar appears to have lost for now, and Libya seems to be moving towards democracy. But it's a long journey to functioning institutions, and we can rest assured that the Gulf monarchies will be there to be unhelpful every step of the way. Which finally brings us to Tunisia, the first Arab Spring country, and the one that was known for most of the past 10 years as the most successful one. Tunisia got a constitution and a series of peaceful transfers of power. But the Gulf countries didn't like the parties that were doing well in this sole Arab democracy. There are many reasons why Tunisia's democracy failed in a coup this past July 25th, but the Gulf monarchies are probably in the top five. Tunisian democracy's main failing was economic, and while it seems like every Arab dictator has an open line of credit in the Gulf, the Arab world's lone democracy got pennies, if it got anything at all. The past decade could have been a miraculous one for democracy in the Arab world. Instead, we got a Gulf monarchy-sponsored disaster. All of this democracy crushing was supposedly justified by fears of the Muslim Brotherhood. There are plenty of Gulf-owned Washington, D.C. think tanks who will pretend that this is a real thing. But as I pointed out a number of years ago, after studying this for, gosh, almost a decade, I'm still not convinced that the unified Muslim Brotherhood conspiracy even exists. I don't really cover the Muslim Brotherhood on this channel because I really don't know what it is. There are plenty of people in Washington, D.C. who will tell you exactly what the Muslim Brotherhood is, and they will do so very confidently. But I'm pretty sure that they don't have any idea what they're actually talking about. The Muslim Brotherhood has been around for 90 years now, and it has meant very different things from decade to decade. For most of its lifetime, the Muslim Brotherhood was heavily supported by Saudi Arabia. Now Qatar and maybe Turkey support some elements of the Brotherhood against Saudi Arabia. That's the story Washington, D.C. has been selling us anyway. The Brotherhood was first condemned in Egypt, then accepted as a normal political party, and now it's ferociously persecuted again. Conflicting offshoots of the Muslim Brotherhood and diverse political outcomes in multiple countries have led to a movement that is impossible to characterize as any one thing. 
Yet some commentators in the United States take these very diverse groups with wildly divergent goals from at least a dozen different countries and multiple different historical eras and try to jam them together into one definition. This doesn't really make any sense, but we have seen this sort of thing before. A couple hundred years back, the countries of Europe and the Americas were subject to waves of revolution. The hereditary aristocrats who ran Europe back then thought they knew exactly what was going on. There was a sinister international network of revolutionaries that controlled everything. This super clear picture was incorrect. There were secret networks and there were affinities between revolutionaries in different countries, but nothing was as tightly controlled or well organized as those conspiracy-minded aristocrats imagined. The priorities and goals of the revolutionaries varied from country to country and even from town to town. It's the same deal in the Arab world 200 years later. The people want democracy, and the monarchs want to convince you it's all a sinister conspiracy. The kings and queens of Europe eventually lost, and the kings of the Arab world will lose eventually too. The oil price alone will see to that. But these absolute monarchs would have already fallen long ago if they weren't propped up by the United States of America. That is how much my country's commitment to democracy is worth in the 21st century so far. Thanks for watching. Please subscribe, like, and comment to tell me what you think. Thanks.